In this video I'll be discussing the war situation going between Dash and Monero. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can try to search for anything related to the features of Dash, especially anonymity and decentralization, and watch people from Monero and Dash fighting over it. The purpose of this video is not to pass judgments on Dash or Monero, but to display how these coins solve different issues that are in Bitcoin and how some solutions led to conflicts with the principles that made cryptocurrency attractive in the first place, like decentralization for example. This video will also explain to you why anonymity or privacy is not a joke and is very necessary when talking about money. Even if you're one of those who say, I have nothing to hide, thinking that this will never affect you. Okay, let's begin. I'll discuss the two main issues these coins try to improve over Bitcoin. One, privacy. Two, speed of transactions and scalability. Let's start with privacy, and let's start with simple examples related to Bitcoin. First, I'll shock you with some piece of information that you may not be familiar with. Say that you have a single Bitcoin, and I have one too. Question. Does your Bitcoin have the same value of mine? You may say, sure, they're both Bitcoin, they're both the same, what's the difference? It's one Bitcoin here and one Bitcoin there. Actually, the answer is not necessarily. Yes, you heard that right. Our Bitcoins don't necessarily have the same value. The reason is blacklisting. To explain how this happens, Let's recall that a few years ago, there was a black market called Silk Road. It sold many illegal items, including drugs. This marketplace used Bitcoin for a while. Now, since all Bitcoin transactions are publicly available on a public ledger, which is called the blockchain, blacklisting can happen when your Bitcoin has some dark history related to it or some illegal activity, like trading on Silk Road or buying weed or even donating to some organization that someone doesn't like, even if it happened like a hundred transactions ago. The problem here is that in a successful peer-to-peer -peer payment system, this shouldn't be the case. When you pay with cash, no one tracks the serial numbers of the cash that you use before accepting it, because it's tedious. Funny enough, there's a study that showed that 90% of the American dollars have traces of drugs on them, and yet no one tracks cash by serial number. Ironic, isn't it? But then why does this happen with digital money? The answer is, it's because it's very easy to do it. The fact that it's very easy and programmable to track money on the blockchain is a big problem for end users. Let's go back to the story. So now, what happens with your blacklisted Bitcoin? Since your Bitcoin is blacklisted, normal exchanges will not accept it, and you can't use it in regular market, which means you're going to have to sell it with a big discount, probably in the black market, to get some of its value back. This effectively means that your blacklisted Bitcoin doesn't have the same value as mine. Even if you weren't the guy who did the crime and have absolutely nothing to do with it. Do you see now why not all bitcoins share the same value? The property that's used technically to describe this feature of assets is called fungibility. An asset is called fungible if all its units have the same value. As we explained, for a coin to be fungible, for a digital coin to be fungible, it's necessary for it to be private and transactions should not be traceable. I hope this explains why privacy is a very serious concern when dealing with digital money. So the question now is, what did people do to solve this problem with Bitcoin? It's a real problem that was there. So, in an attempt to make Bitcoin anonymous, something called the Bitcoin Mixer was invented. A mixer basically takes bitcoins from many sources, puts them all in one big pile, and redistributes them. This ruins traceability, that's true, but I don't see how that fixes the blacklisting issue, and I don't think it does. The reason why I think that this does not fix the blacklisting problem 
is that it's easy to mark all coins coming from a mixer as blacklisted. Done. It's over. There's nothing to fix anymore once they're marked blacklisted. On the contrary, you took one coin that's blacklisted and you ruined all the other coins by making them blacklisted because you put them in one pile. This doesn't solve the problem. However, the Bitcoin mixer is useful for inducing anonymity. There is no way to know where this money came from unless you gain access to the mixer system and see what happened in there and who sent what. One issue with such a mixer is that we're assuming here that the mixer is trustable. This is why it's said that anonymity in a mixer requires trust. If the mixer is compromised or gave you up for some reason, the identities related to the transactions may be compromised. This even goes beyond trust. A few months ago, we learned from WikiLeaks that the CIA has a whole division that finds vulnerabilities in software to use them against their targets, instead of reporting them to be fixed. And by the way, we're not asserting here that the CIA as an organization has bad intentions, because this point may be controversial. You can simply imagine that a single corrupt individual that works in the CIA could ruin your life, because he has the power. An example of a similar situation is Edward Snowden who ignored his company's policy and decided to do something different, albeit publicly and for different reasons. This basically undermines the privacy of such mixers. Even worse, what if the CIA itself or some hostile organization buys into such mixers secretly? It would be a mess. After we've learned about mixers and their potential issues, let's start talking about Dash a little and discuss what Dash offers here. You can look at the groups that run the Dash network as three groups. One, the typical miners that maintain and run the blockchain, which is the ledger of all the transactions that happen in the network. Number two, the master nodes, which is an authority, and every master node has voting rights. Number three is what I would call the company administration, which runs the software development of Dash and the marketing campaigns. In Bitcoin and Monero, the miners take 100% of the mining reward, which means that a miner who successfully collects submitted transactions and creates a block to be part of the blockchain receives a reward that he does not have to share with anyone. On the other hand, in Dash, the miner reward is distributed as 45% for the miner, 45% for the master nodes, and finally, a 10% for the company's administration. If you're wondering why the master nodes in Dash are paid, they are paid for three services they provide. One, they keep a copy of the blockchain. Two, they support instant send, which we'll be talking about. Three, they support private send. Now, private send is basically the crux of the privacy in Dash, and we'll be talking about this now. So how does Dash introduce privacy? Dash basically took the Bitcoin mixer idea and bundled it in the Dash system. That's it. So, it's a Dash mixer that's executed by the master nodes. People who are against this say that this is a system that requires trust because we don't have to trust masternodes in general. Or at best, even if we trust masternodes, how can we be sure that masternodes have sufficient security to protect information? Can we really be sure? Remember the CIA examples I made before? Imagine now that any organization can buy Dash masternodes, which costs like 1000 Dash, by the way, and gain power in the network. Can it be any worse? I don't think so. Not only that transactions are compromised, but we also have the illusion that they're private. One more issue with Dash's privacy is that it's optional, which is viewed as ridiculous by many people. The reason for viewing it this way is very simple. If privacy is optional, then it's easy to forbid it by rejecting all Dash coins that have private send history. 
and hence destroying fungibility, which was the main reason why we did all this, why we started all this privacy thing. Once this is established, then Dash's privacy is useless, because no one can use it, and then it's easy to ban certain activities, such as donations to institutions that don't follow some unpreferred agenda, and here we are at the same problem of what's criminal and what's not criminal, and organizations start taking sides and fungibility is lost, and instead of dealing with money as money, we start testing whether money is blacklisted every time we have to use it. This is basically the contention of the people who criticize Dash's privacy. In other simpler words, Dash potentially has all the privacy problems that Bitcoin has due to the fact that it uses a mixer that requires trust, and that's optional. Now Monero, on the other hand, has trustless privacy, meaning privacy that is embedded in the system and does not require trusting any third parties. Privacy in Monero is done through cryptography, using ring signatures. With Monero, it's not possible to track the sender or receiver of a transaction, period. There's no exceptions, there's nothing special, there's no trust. That's why Monero coins are really fungible. Now obviously, Monero wins the fungibility contest. Now I personally think that one of the reasons why people keep arguing about Monero versus Dash is that Dash tried to introduce privacy, but did it really, really bad. From my perspective, I don't see Dash as a private coin in any way, but I see that it has other features, like the possibility of doing very fast transactions, which is the next topic. At this point, I'd like to make the distinction between scalability and the speed of transactions. From a technical point of view, I see that scalability means that the network should retain the same transaction processing rate when the number of transactions submitted increases. In other words, the speed of processing a transaction and confirming it should be roughly independent of the number of transactions submitted in the network. Meaning, for example, if we submit 1,000 transactions per second, or we submit 1 million transactions per second, the, proce the, the speed of processing transactions should not change, regardless of whether it's one hour or one day. That's what I call scalability. On the other hand, transaction speed or confirmation speed is the property that requires setting a deadline for calling a service successful. For example, when I need to make a transaction to buy a cup of coffee, it should not take more than 10 seconds. Taking more than 10 seconds is a failure in the system, regardless of the state of the network, regardless whether 1,000 transactions are submitted or 1 million or 1. This property I would call transaction speed or confirmation speed. This is often confused with scalability. I'm making this distinction because Dash and Monero have different characteristics in each of these features. So, how do Dash and Monero compare there? I'll give you the summary. Dash does not have a dynamic scalability solution, while Monero does. On the other hand, Monero does not have a fast transaction solution, while Dash does. Let's start with scalability, which is directly proportional to the block size. If you're wondering what a block is, it's basically the smallest unit of the blockchain and it's the smallest unit that can be added to a blockchain at a time by a miner. When a miner successfully creates a new block, it means that new transactions have been written to the ledger. It matters because every new block is considered a confirmation for all the transactions that happened before. You probably have heard of the Bitcoin SegWit 2x debate, this whole argument was about changing the block size from 1 megabytes to 2 megabytes, in the interest of improving scalability. The size of a block in the Dash system has a fixed value, just like Bitcoin, but can be changed with human intervention. This is the same Bitcoin SegWit 2x problem that we saw before, except that Dash has a voting system to decide when to do it. Which is a good thing, I'd say, 
much better than the ridiculous segue to X parity we saw with Bitcoin. At least this contributes to keeping the market stable in Dash. On the other hand, Monero has a dynamic block size that changes whenever the number of transactions increases within the last 100 blocks. So again, Monero wins in scalability. Now let's talk about speed of transactions or confirmation speed. I have to be clear and say that this is a problem with all distributed systems. So all non-centralized cryptocurrencies have this problem. So far, from a technical point of view, there is no way to make fast transactions without centralization. This is because distributed systems use the gossip protocol to deliver messages to everyone in the network, which takes a long time. If you're not familiar with the gossip protocol, the gossip protocol simply means that every node tells the nodes connected to it. So unless the system is centralized, there is no way to fix this based on current technology. This is actually how Bitcoin is planning to solve the problem by introducing the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is a place where you deposit some of your coins and then that network will act as a centralized entity to process your transactions without having to pass every little thing you do to the blockchain. Ripple, which is another cryptocurrency that's made specially for banking, solved this problem because it's centralized and its transactions are fast now with a rate of about 3.6 seconds. Now talking about Monero, Monero does not have any fast transaction solution. There are plans to create something equivalent to the Lightning Network for it. That's all to say about it. There's nothing else. On the other hand, Dash does have fast transaction solution, which is called Instant Send. The centralized entity there is the master nodes, and transactions there take a few seconds when using Instant Send. So in fast transactions, Dash wins over Monero. While Dash solved the problem of fast transactions with masternodes, many are not happy with the idea of masternodes. I have found many contentions on the idea, including the following. 1. Not everyone can be a masternode. Because you need at least 1000 Dash in your possession to be a masternode. If a single Dash costs 500 euros, the one needs half a million euros to become a masternode. It's considered unfair because some people were just lucky and mined when the system started when Dash was very cheap. The question comes as, why should those people have authority in the system and reap the fruits of the miners? Number two, while cryptocurrency can be seen as a transfer of wealth from central banks to a new kind of people. The system of masternodes that only requires the possession of certain amounts of Dash makes it easy for the system to be owned by a new monarchy that acts just like central banks, which basically defeats the purpose of cryptocurrency, which is having decentralized money that's not controlled by any authorities. In other words, the Dash network is available for sale. If you pay a few billions, it's all yours and every miner will be paying you for the rest of their lives. Yes, I know, you think that's crazy. But while we talk about cryptocurrency as a replacement of money, think of what would happen if some authority was able to buy the dollar currency with all its authority and value and just for a few billion dollars. And finally, I'd like to emphasize that what I'm saying here is not my personal opinion. This is what I gathered in my journey when learning about the war between Dash and Monero. To come to the conclusion of this video, 1. The primary contention of people on Dash is that it solves the problem that are caused by decentralization by creating new centralized entities that have unjustified perks where a new monarchy can easily be created by whoever pays. Number two, Monero does not have a fast transaction solution, but it solved every other problem Dash claimed to have solved with no loopholes. The only problem I see with Monero is that it's difficult to use. 
because it primarily uses command line tools. This is no problem for me personally, because I'm a software dev, but I saw people often complain about this, and this might be a problem against mainstream adoption. On the bright side though, the Monero team keeps developing GUI tools over time to make it easier. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe, and click on that bell to receive notifications on everything new from my channel. What's your opinion on this war? Do you think Dash is flawed? Let me know in the comments and tell me what you think.